They are a trans guy drag queen and a queer trans and intersex art historian. Please welcome to the stage for trans and intersex art history with Sweet Gwendolyn. Sweet Gwendolyn! Thank you. Greetings, Gender Unbound 2018. I'm just going to give a little preamble here for a moment to give people a chance to filter over to this area. But as previously stated, I am, in fact, Sweet Gwendolyn. And in addition to that, I am also a trans guy drag queen named Debbie Penetration. And in addition to that, I am a queer erotic art and gender non-conforming art historian. So how I go about doing this is I have a Tumblr page where I upload the images, I write an article full of references and citations, links to further reading, and then uh, you do not need to have a Tumblr account to be able to see that. I'll have the links up at the end, and I also have cards I can give you with it written out. But um, just because most people like to see it in their feed, I cross-post it on Facebook, so I have a Facebook page you can like and get that in your daily feed. Um, I also just want to put a disclaimer in advance that I have gone to great lengths to try and... I'm going to be talking about world cultures. I am trying very hard to pronounce everything correctly. If I happen to get something wrong, please talk to me about it after the show, and I apologize in advance for that. Um, as to how I came about doing this, I am a full-time disabled person, and I spend a lot of time in bed, uh, and I wanted to find something productive I could do with my time, and I couldn't help but notice that people act like queer people only just started existing in really kind of just the last couple of decades. Trans people have apparently only existed for the last couple of years. And so the truth is that as long as there have been people, there have been queer, transgender, and intersex people, and that we have been accepted, if not totally revered, in societies of all eras and geographic locations. If you do not know how things once were, then you are less likely to fight for how they could be again. Queer history did not begin at Stonewall, and I've got the pictures to prove it. <laughs> yeah! yeah. Alright, and we'll have a Q&A after the slideshow. So, we're gonna start back in ancient Rome, and this slide comes to us from the 2nd or 3rd century of the Common Era, and is a Roman mosaic from North Africa of the popular Greek god Hermaphroditus, who was enthusiastically adopted by the Romans, and despite being almost totally censored from modern history books, is among the most widely depicted deities in Roman antiquity. Hermaphroditus was the god of effeminate men, who was originally the son of Hermes and Aphrodite, whose body was merged with that of the water nymph Salmascus, and she became enamored of him and pray prayed to the gods that they never be parted. Legend had it that if a man drank from this pool, then that person too could turn into a woman. In this scene, Hermaphroditus is depicted nude with assigned female hips, breasts, and hair, as well as a penis and scrotum while regarding themselves in a hand mirror. And I just wanted to say, if you want to do your own Google image search, you will find dozens of images of Hermaphroditus. I just wanted to pick, I, I felt like, the, three of the best examples. So this slide is also a statue of Hermaphroditus, and it's from the Roman city of Pompeii, meaning that the statue is no more recent than when the city was destroyed in the year 79 of the Common Era. In this scene, Hermaphroditus has a feminine hairstyle, a cut breast, and a penis while striking what would, in modern times, be considered a, uh, a highly recognizably fierce pose. <laughs> And this slide also comes to us from Pompeii, and is no more recent than the year 79 of the Common Era. Hermaphroditus is depicted here as a figure with assigned male facial features, a feminine hairstyle, a predominantly assigned male torso, but with very definite A-cut breasts, slight hips that are mostly in accentuation of posture, and a penis. This slide is of a golden popero of what appears to be a man with a vagina from Colombia, and it's estimated to be from the admittedly very wide range of uh, 600 to 1100 CE. In this scene, a figure with a predominantly assigned male body and facial features, a septum piercing, and a vagina smiles with their eyes shut as they sit on a stool. 
A potpourri was a device used by indigenous cultures in present and pre-Columbian South America for storage of small amounts of lime, being the mineral, not the fruit, to chew coca leaves with, which was considered sacred and was restricted to the highest classes. Because of this, a potpourri was associated with mystical powers and social status. This is a statue from the 11th century CE India, located in the Ganga Kanda Cholapuram Temple. Ardhana Rishwara is a depiction of Shiva joined with Parvati, split evenly down the middle, and the name Ardhana Rishwara literally means the Lord who is half woman. Shiva is typically depicted on the right side, while Parvati is typically, but not always, depicted on the left, and depictions in this style began in the first century of the Common Era. Ardhana Vishwara statues are among the most popular depictions of Shiva and are present at most of his temples. This slide comes to us from 1631 Spain. In this scene, a figure with a thick beard and signs of balding is wearing the female clothes of the time and is breastfeeding an infant. This painting was a commissioned family portrait of Magdalena Ventura, who became bearded at age 37. And the inscription painted on the stones on the right corner declares her to be a miracle of nature and goes on to give her backstory in Latin. The painting was recently reviewed by a medical journal, which concluded that the most likely explanation for her condition was a benign androgen producing tumor of the ovary, now called an androblastoma. The information in the inscription, the use of feminine pronouns and feminine dress, and the strangely yet prominently placed breast and suckling infant in, uh, and other uh, feminine objects in the painting seem to be for the purpose of emphasizing her feminine identity. This slide comes to us from Zaire and is an ivory carving depicting an intersex figure. In this scene, the figure is sitting with their knees pulled up to their body and with their hands folded across their chest. The undercarriage view of the carving reveals a penis no scrotum, and a fully formed vulva which has a clitoris distinct from their se uh, separate and fully formed penis. This slide comes to us from Mali and is by a artist from the Dogon people. Intersex figures such as this one are commonly depicted in Dogon art. In this scene, we see a figure with a beard, breasts, and what appears to be a penis hanging over labia, standing with puck of lips. And this slide is of an undated, painted, wooden sculpture that comes to us from Bali, Indonesia. In this scene, an assigned male-bodied figure with a vagina is standing with their knees bent and spread apart. The central figure is flanked by mustachioed figures with assigned female frames and large penises. While I have no information on the significance of the imagery, in the process of researching this image, I discovered an additional, much older, carved sculpture depicting an identical scene, thereby suggesting that there are many more of these out there and that this is a depiction invoking an image assumed to already be familiar and significant to its intended audience. All right, the next two slides have a much, much longer write-up than any of the other ones I've done so far. And the reason for that is that I would really like to explain to everyone here that Edo-era Japan was literally a queer paradise. Everyone was more or less presumed to be bisexual, teenagers all dressed androgynously, and there were ample opportunities, socially accepted opportunities, for cross-dressing going in both directions. So I'd like to go a little more in depth for these two. This slide is a piece of early pop culture and features a troupe of wakashu geisha from the mid-1790s Edo-era Japan in a boy band style group picture which could serve as either an advertisement for the troupe or as an early pinup for their admiring fans, both male and female. During the Edo era, assigned male children went through three phases of life. As young children, their hair was unshaven, and when they became teenagers, they became known as wakashu, and were identifiable by their shaven forelocks and folded ponytails. When they had their coming-of-age ceremony in their late teens or early twenties, the tops of their heads were shaven, making them identifiable as adults or yaro. Wakashu were socially prized for their beauty and were considered appropriate for sex with both 
women and males who had had their coming of age ceremony, though not with other wakashi. With, uh, with women, they would be the active partner during sex, and with men, they would, at least in theory, according to social norms, be the receptive partner. Wakashu are typically drawn nearly completely identical to uh, women in Edo art, but they are always there are always several key identifying features to signify the identities of both Wakashu and women to the viewer. In this case, Wakashu in the image all have shaven forelocks, which is the area of the hairline just above the forehead. And though drawn subtly on most of the figures, the shaven forelocks are the most evident on the wakashu on the far left of the middle row. And when his hairline is used for comparison, it becomes more obvious on his true paints. Additionally, the viewer can tell that these are all wakashu because of their folded ponytails, whereas women's hair at the time featured a large comb that ran from side to side across the crown of the head. That said, it is worth noting that as commonplace as male sex work was in Edo, Japan, Geisha's function uh, was to complement the sex workers around them and not to have sex with their clients. Geisha first appeared in the 1690s as skilled male entertainers who would entertain customers as they waited to see popular sex workers. Female Geisha did not appear until the 1750s and originally dressed as men and shaved their hair like wakashu and styled it the same way to look identical to their male counterparts and were known as Howry Geisha, named for the men's Howry jackets that they wore. And I also just wanted to say I have, I'm halfway through writing a article for my Tumblr page on Howry Geisha, which should be up in the next couple of days. So this next slide also comes to us from Edo era Japan, and this one is from 1790. Onagata actors became a theatrical staple once a law had passed mandating the exclusion of female actors in 1629. Given the need for female characters to tell stories reflecting daily life, Onagata roles became widespread. Given the sheer numbers, it is difficult to infer anything about the actors who portrayed these roles, but as some actors who specialized in Onagata roles chose to live as women off the stage, as well, these roles would likely have been pursued by people who today would have been regarded as transgender women in the West. The government temporarily banned Wakashu and Onagata actors in 1652, but reinstated them the next year with the caveat that the actors now had to shave the tops of their heads in the same manner that adult men did. The Onagata actor, actors then took up the practice of wearing headscarves fitted uh, to cover only the shaven bald spot, as can be seen in the image. Onagata can be identified in art by their purple head scars in combination with the female hairstyles, which can be distinguished by large coming running side to side across the top of the head, and in this image also the hairpins that are sticking out on either side of the head. Beginning in 1751, Migawi, which were commercially available prints or prints, uh, paintings or prints of popular actors, became widely available and very popular, making Japan the first known place to develop a modern pop culture. Prior to Megawi prints, which were made both for artistic purposes as well as commercial advertisement, such art featured general stylized depictions of well-known kabuki characters without attempting to portray the individual actors playing the roles. For this reason, Onagata in this era were frequently artistically depicted as idealized versions of cisgender women, though the public would have understood that they were Onagata performers. Ryuko Sai Joke is thought to be the first artist to portray Onagata explicitly as assigned male actors playing female roles rather than as cisgender women, which can be seen in this, uh, in this well-known Onagata actor, Nakamura Tomi Juro's assigned male features visible in this illustration. This slide comes to us from 1909 France and is by the artist Niklas Vadas, who immigrated to Hungary uh, and became an illustrator for the weekly satirical magazine La Siette au Beurre, which literally translates into the butter plate, but idiomatically translates into the pork barrel. The magazine was satirical and often focused on socialist and anarchist themes and was notable for having a vivid and graphically illustrated cover each week. In this cartoon, a well-dressed male presenting figure is standing outside the front door to a house and is speaking to the butler. The caption is in French, but translated it reads, 
<laughs> well, Sue, the Baron, is not receiving visitors. Now figure. Tell him it's Lucy. This slide is also by the same artist from the same publication and is almost definitely the cover to the same issue. And in this scene, a queer figure rocks the gender spectrum in very stylish men's clothing on the t of the time, striking a pose as they place one hand on their hips, which are jauntily tilted out to the side, while the other hand, laden with jewelry, brings two fingers to their lips in a voguish pose. The caption for the cover is in French, but it translates into the little young gentleman. At the turn of the 20th century, it was already considered to be roguishly chic for a signed female bohemian artist to dress in men's suits. In 1909, the year this cover illustration was published, bohemian women in Paris, which is where the magazine is located, had additionally begun cropping their hair short, which rapidly spread through bohemian artist circles throughout the world. Given that a signed female bohemian artist dressing in men's suits was already an established phenomenon, and that assigned female people had just begun cropping their hair short in the city that the magazine was paced and that the magazine was a topical publication. It seems likely that both the cover and the cartoon were commentaries on the phenomenon. This is bolstered by the caption referring to the gentleman as being small and is further bolstered by the related cartoon which more explicitly depicts an assigned female character in a suit. In, this, in light of this, it seems fairly certain that this cover depicts transmasculine imagery, but either way, it definitely depicts a gender non-conforming, queer, fabulous person of the day. And our final slide is by an artist named Voodoo, and it's from Berlin in the 1920s. It's touched upon in the movie Cabaret, though it was definitely not equal to Edo-era Japan, which had total cultural acceptance on matters of gender and sexuality. Weimar Berlin was also a paradise for gender and sexual minorities who began congregating and networking in large numbers there. Though Berlin had the largest and most active queer population in the Western world, it is worth noting that other major Western cities had similar, if smaller, scenes during the same period, which enjoyed a brief period of popularity for the straight world, which was referred to as the pansy craze, and this was most no notable in Harlem in the U.S. In this scene, a person with long hair, a feminine appearance, and carriage, who also has a penis, gracefully dances with ribbons on a stage in the nude. All right, and that was the last slide, and if you would like to check this out online, just, just so you know, I took an ax to the descriptions of all those. So all of those slides have dramatically more information about them online. And like I said earlier, uh, if you go to that link on Tumblr, you can look at the full gallery of everything I've posted. You don't need to have a Tumblr account in order to view it. However, if you are on Facebook and you would like this art as a part of your regular feed, I have a Facebook page that you can just go and hit the like button and it should start showing up. Um, it's hard to say, there have been times where I posted daily, there have been times where I took a long break. Right now I'd say I'm posting about one or two times a week. And I think that's it. And we can do some Q&A if anyone has any questions. Any questions? <laughs> about how far back would you say that, um, that the earliest thing, uh, can you repeat when the earliest known time for someone like us was in history? So Rocky wants to know what the earliest depiction of a transgender or intersex figure is, and I have absolutely no idea. Certainly the hermaphroditus yeah. uh, imagery is all in the two to three thousand year old range, and I've seen, oh, I'm to think. I've definitely seen a lot of stuff from that time range, including uh, Asia Minor, but I, I don't have a good answer to that off the top of my head, and it would be wrong anyway, it would just be whatever we found. It's, it's actually really hard to get good information on queer archaeology, because mainly it's straight people finding it anyway, and they misidentify it. Um, a lot of what I find is actually misclassified as being uh, gay or lesbian, and uh, a lot of times they just miss, I don't know, it's, it's just weird, like I, it's not even on their radar, so it just takes a, a close eye to yeah. be looking for it, so I, I'm sure as long as there have been 
people, people, we have been there, and as long as we have been there, there have been artistic depictions of us. Yeah, that makes sense. Does anyone else have any questions about either any of the slides we looked at or the project itself? Okay. Well, I think that's it. And if anyone would like a card with this information, the website information written down on it, just talk to me. And if you have any questions that you want to just, uh, you don't want to shout out, but you'd like to get an answer to, I'm going to be here for the rest of the day if you want to just come up. Thank you very much. One more time, please, for Sweet Gwendolyn, please. Excellent. Thank you very much.